Okay, so that's off, that's off, that's off, that is on. I think we're good to go. So, without further ado, why don't I go ahead and get this stuff started before something happens. All right, there we go. Hello, Shadowcat back, and today we're taking a, a little bit of a, a steering away from the whole politics thing, kinda, little bit. We're gonna dabble in it just a little bit, but I mean, today is not gonna be an intensely political episode. Maybe putting a little bit of a break in there, I know people get tired of the whole politics thing, but we are gonna be talking about culture, and culture and politics very much intertwined. We're going to be talking about law a little bit here. So, I mean, first things first, obviously I am not a lawyer. And I only have a very cursory understanding of the law. That being said, while my understanding is only cursory, I do have a pretty firm understanding in the things that I actually know. I mean, I know what my definitions are. I know basics. It should be enough to carry us through this lecture. Um, couple of, uh, couple of conditions, though, on this one. Number one, I am feeling a little off this morning, so if I sound a bit... Yeah, it's because my throat's feeling a bit rough this morning. Probably means that I'm sick. And the thing is, I didn't even do Thanksgiving this year. Okay, we're, we're, my household is not doing Thanksgiving until sub, or Sunday, tomorrow. Okay, we're not doing Thanksgiving until tomorrow, so I don't know where I got it from. And secondly, I think that my, uh, my modem is a little on the fried side, so if this stream ends early, it's probably because the internet went out. I've already got a work order in to get it fixed, but, you know, it's Thanksgiving weekend, so, um, yeah, they're not coming. Not, not for a while yet. So, fingers crossed that, uh, that this actually works, and we make it through this all the way to the end. So... I look in the chat, and the number of people in the chat is deceptive. Tux was here, says, gonna have to miss this one, but good luck, don't let YouTube bite you. I mean, every single lecture I do is basically me asking YouTube to bite me. And JP is in the chat. Hello, JP. I thought you were on a trip. Are you back from your trip already? Or, or did you take us with you on the trip? Because if that's the case, then, oh boy. I get to have, like, a whole cruise ship full of audience. You you are playing me in the auditorium, right? Or a theater, or whatever it is. I don't know, never actually been on a cruise ship. Seems okay, though. Anyway, today, discussion. Um, today was inspired, actually, by Netflix. Yes, that Netflix. The one that brought us, um... The one that brought us, uh, the, the new animated version of Scott Pilgrim. Because, uh... Yeah, I got really excited, and then I got really disappointed, and then when I get disappointed, I do things. I do stupid things, you know, like like do live streams on a particular subject. And JP says, you're in the Gulf of Mexico. I just want to... I just want to put how jealous I am right now into numbers, because numbers make things easy to uh, to understand. It is currently 31 degrees outside. Yeah, that's how jealous I am right now, you... Anyway. Um, Scott Pilgrim came out this week on Netflix, and I was actually kind of excited. Now, full disclosure, I did not even know Scott Pilgrim vs. The World existed until the movie came out. Didn't even know. Never heard of it before. And even when the movie came out, I never saw it. I had heard it was good. Everyone said it was good, but I don't I don't get to uh I don't get to see a whole lot of movies. So by the time I uh I I got around to seeing Scott Pilgrim, it had been out for years. It was like free on some online video service, and I got to see it there. So Obviously, when I did see it, I was like, oh, this is really good. And then, you know, years later, when Netflix is doing their adaptation, I was like, oh, I didn't even know this was coming. I want to see it. And then I did not see it. However, before I had a chance to see it, and mind you, I was actually going to watch it that day. 
I got or the reviews came in and the reviews were not good. They were not good. And basically, it's just more of the same of what we've been dealing with for years now. And so I want to talk about this. Now, I've already talked about some of what we're going to cover today. Because a few months ago, several months ago maybe actually, uh, we talked about The Little Mermaid. And specifically, we talked about the, the idea and the concept of race baiting and race swapping. And we talked about the cultural implications of that. Because it's been very obvious that there is an agenda that is being pushed. And that continues to this day. However, that is not what I really want to talk about today. Because we've already talked about that one. My opinions on that have not changed. And while we will touch upon that, it'll be very brief. Today, I want to talk about the actual legal implications of what's going on right now. Because we have seen a trend of these bait-and-switch television shows, films animations, everything. And we have seen many knock-on effects from that. So we're going to go into what is bait and switch. We're going to go into what is happening in... I want to say Hollywood, but it's more decentralized than Hollywood. It's not just Hollywood. Because it's Hollywood. It's Netflix. It's Disney. It's, it, it's everywhere at this point. It is a bandwagon that everyone has jumped on, and I don't think that any of them ever really thought about where this train was going to lead them when they jumped on it. But they jumped on it anyway, and so here we are. So why don't we get into the discussion, and we'll talk about everything as these things pop up. So what is bait and switch? Bait and switch is actually a subcategory of something called fraud. Now, when it comes to fraud, fraud is actually a very, very simple concept to understand. Criminal fraud is basically just the legalized version of lying and cheating. Okay? Obviously, lying is not a crime. Cheating is not a crime until you do them in specific circumstances, which is why we have the differences in terms. Fraud is specifically a legal definition, and that's why I came to this Associate of Certified Fraud Examiner. That is very tiny text. Uh, their website, so we can just go into what is fraud, because I am not a lawyer, but they are. So we're going to read through a little bit of this, just briefly, because, um, well, actually, no, we might actually read the whole thing. It's not that long. I thought it was going to be longer. But we're going to go into this, and this is going to lay the foundation of what we're talking about today. So, what is fraud? Fraud is any activity that relies on deception in order to achieve a gain. And JP says cheating is illegal in Vegas. Again? Circumstances. Cheating is illegal in a casino in Vegas. If I was going to cheat you playing blackjack at home, that's not illegal. It's only illegal if you cheat at the casino. And the reason why is because upon entering the casino, you are implicitly agreeing to play by the casino's rules. That is a tacit agreement. It is essentially a nonverbal contract that you entered into upon entering the building. And so when you get down to it, cheating in Vegas is essentially breach of contract. Now, they're not going to argue it that way, but that's what it essentially is. So, what is fraud? Fraud is any activity that relies on deception in order to achieve a gain. Fraud becomes a crime when it is knowing misrepresentation of the truth or concealment of a material fact to induce another to act to his or her detriment. This is according to Black's 
uh, Black's Law Dictionary. In other words, if you lie in order to deprive a person or organization of their money or property, you are committing fraud. Now, it goes into why do people commit fraud? You can basically just sum that in up as why do people commit crimes in general? Because some people just do. Uh, the fraud triangle, I mean, you basically just saw it right there. Yeah, either way. Uh, we don't need to go into a lot of this. Basically, just what we needed was the what is fraud, okay? So that right there, that's pretty much everything we need to know. In other words, if you lie in order to deprive a person or organization of their money or property, you're committing fraud. Okay, very simple. Like I said, you don't need to be a lawyer to understand these very basic concepts. And in fact, it would do a lot more people a lot of good if they were to take a basic law class and understand a lot of these basic concepts. So that's fraud. And I figured... If we're going to have a definition, we should also probably have examples. So I did just a quick Google search and I grabbed some, okay? Uh, this one is five most scandalous fraud cases of 2021. It's a little old, but the fact is, fraud is fraud. It, the fact that it's aged doesn't really make it any difference or any different. So let's go ahead and make this a little bit bigger so I can read it. Uh, let's see, 2021, a possible end of the COVID-19 pandemic was on the horizon with the introduction of the vaccine, but fraudsters weren't quite finished bilking it for billions. So let's take a look at some of these. Uh, the COVID-19 unemployment insurance fraud is an international affair. Uh, bots or teams of low-wage workers to complete online forms and file phony unemployment claims in all 50 U.S. states, an international collection of fraudsters raked in billions of pandemic unemployment relief funds to commit what U.S. prosecutors say could be the biggest wave of fraud in U.S. history. The Office of the Inspector General for the U.S. Department of Labor estimates about $87 billion in fraudulent claims. By the way, that's claims. So that doesn't necessarily mean that they were actually paid out, just that that much was requested. Some experts think the losses could be in the hundreds of billions. Um, see, in July, ProPublica published a staggering report uh, upon revealing that organized crime in the U.S. and abroad was responsible for most U.S. COVID-19 unemployment insurance frauds. Fraudsters filed high volumes of online unemployment applications and obtained payments from multiple states, utilizing bots to automatically populate forms with stolen identities. Chinese and West African crime syndicates hired low-wage workers in various company or countries to input stolen data into unemployment portals. One U.S. state received claims from IP addresses in nearly 170 countries. Now, this is actually very interesting because when people talk about online security, and no, I am not sponsored by NordVPN. However, if NordVPN would like to sponsor me, I mean, I'm here, I'm listening. But when they talk about online security and they talk about how people will fish or hack websites and they talk about data breaches and things, this is what's actually happening. What they'll do is people will look for an exploit into a website or they'll hack something and they'll get a file of information. Maybe it's not even a complete file. It's just data. They've got the raw data and they can decipher the data. This is where your data actually ends up. And this is what actually ends up happening with it. Which means that, yes, statistically speaking, it is possible that you might actually have some kind of unemployment claim out in your name that you never filed for and never knew about. Because all it would have taken is for your information to be on a website, for that website's security to be compromised, for the data compromise to be sent to some Chinese tech um, mill, and here it is. So, this is just one form of fraud. If we scroll down, can I get more? Here we go, yes. Uh, DOJ targets a massive telemedicine fraud. Uh, the DOJ announced a six-long national health care enforcement action in which it arrested 138 people, including 42 doctors, nurses, and other licensed health care professionals for their alleged participation in schemes involving telemedicine. 
uh, COVID-19 related healthcare fraud, illegal opioid distribution, and substance use treatment facilities. In total, the schemes resulted in more than $1.4 billion in losses. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but you get the idea. Uh, what else we got? The Colonial Pipeline and the Year of Ransomware. This was actually a really fun one, because I remember this one. In the early morning hours of May 7, 2021, an employee in the Colonial Pipeline's control room discovered a ransom note from hackers demanding cryptocurrency in exchange for the decryption of the oil and gas's firm's data. The company quickly shut down its 5,500 miles of pipeline that transports 2.5 million barrels of fuel daily from Texas to New Jersey to contain the threat. The pipeline eventually paid them nearly $5 million in Bitcoin to resume its operation five days later, but not before there were long lines at the gas stations and higher fuel prices and panic buying. Yeah, I remember that. I was not actually affected by it, but I remember it. I, I'm close enough to New Jersey to, uh, to have heard all about it, you know, from people who were affected. So, these are all instances of fraud. Now, there are also other other things that were um, affecting this. For example, in the Colonial Pipeline one, not only is this fraud, but this is also, um, uh, what would the proper terms be? It would be computer fraud as well as, uh, what's the legal term for unauthorized access? Because they don't actually call it hacking. I think they literally just call it unauthorized access to a secure computer system or something like that. But you get the idea. Fraud. Basically, doing what you can to coerce people out of what they're doing. Just not through violence, you're doing so through dishonesty. Okay. What we need is foundation there so we can actually talk about bait and switch. Because, as I stated in the beginning, bait and switch is kind of a subcategory of fraud. Now, bait and switch is a term that came about a few decades ago, really, because bait and switch has been going for a long time. When they talk about things like snake oil salesmen, um, snake oil salesmen were the original bait and switch people, where they would sell you something, claiming that it would have a myriad of beneficial effects to you. It would cure whatever it was ailing you. It would make you feel better. It would rejuvenate your youth. It would make you look younger. Whatever it had. Of course, they never did any of that. And these people were regarded as frauds and hacks, and they were usually chased out of town. Sometimes they were even arrested. Bait and switch, however, is a term that came about in the, I believe it was the 70s and 80s, because with the advent of television, and the ability for these people to reach massive audiences. Television had been turned into a hotbed of bait and switch, where you could be promised just about anything, so long as you were to come down and check out whatever they were offering. And of course, once you got there, you would find out that it was in fact not what you were expecting. At which point it was redefined to be its own thing, and then it was criminalized. So this is from the Legal Information Institute. They say a bait and switch takes place when a seller, specifically a seller, creates an appealing but ingenuine offer to sell a product or service, which the seller does not actually intend to sell. The initial advertised offer is the bait. Then the seller switches customers from buying the advertised product or service that the seller initially offered into buying a completely different product or service that is usually at a higher price or has some other advantageous effect to the advertiser. In my experience, it's usually not been at a higher price because then people just wouldn't do it, but usually it's something of lower quality that has a better profit margin. This is of course then the switch. Normally, the switch product that the consumer buys is usually at a higher price, an increased profit for the seller, or may have less marketable characteristic than the product being advertised. A bait and switch is different from a loss leader sale, which is when a seller specifically notifies a customer that only a limited number of units of product are for sale at a discount. 
bait and switch advertising is grounds for an action of common law fraud, unjust enrichment, and sometimes breach of contract. A bait and switch is also a violation of the Consumer Fraud and Deceptive Business Practices Act. Now, they just described a loss leader, which is where they will put out an offer and say, we have 1,000 items, but the first 100 will be 50% off, okay? After that, they're going to go up in price. And of course, you know, when you get there, they, they inform you that, you know, sorry, but they're already all sold out. So you have to buy them all at the, the uh, main price. It becomes a lost leader sale when it's revealed that, in fact, there were no half-off items and they were all going to be, you know, the, the, um, the full price. There's also another one that is kind of tangentially related to, and it is called, uh, what's it called? See, this is why I'm not a lawyer. I can't remember all these things. Um, oh, right. Artificial scarcity. That's what I wanted. Artificial scarcity. And in particular, the companies of Apple and Nintendo are very guilty of this one. Both of them like to use this one a great deal. Apple more so, Nintendo slightly less. But the idea there being that they will advertise that they only have so many. And so it drives up a panic by creating an artificial demand for a product, even though there was more than enough supply to create that demand, or not to create the demand. Hold on. I told you, I'm not feeling my, my best today. They advertise that they have a lower supply to create an artificial demand, even though they have supply to meet the demand. This, of course, lets them jack up prices sometimes if they're bold enough to try that, and sometimes they are. I do believe that Apple was guilty of doing that. Nintendo, it's a bit uh, questionable whether or not they can actually meet demand or not, but Nintendo has been found guilty of doing that in the past. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about artificial security. We're not talking about loss leader sales. We're talking about bait and switch. So, in federal claims court, the key components for evaluating a claim of improper bait and switch by the recipient of the contract is whether, number one, the seller represented an initial proposal that they would rely on uh, certain specified employee staff while performing the services. Number two, the recipient relied on this representation of information when evaluating the proposal. And number three, it was foreseeable and probable that the employee staff named in the initial proposal would not be available to implement the contract work. And four, employee staff, other than those listed in the initial proposal, instead were or would be performing these services. That is one example, and I don't think it's even a very good example, but you get the idea. Basically, what was advertised is not what's being provided. And I've got a good example. It's a really good example. Unfortunately, it's also the only example I could get because you just don't really see very many bait and switch um, cases these days, mostly because bait and switch is usually pretty obvious. And when you get caught baiting and switching, it usually becomes common knowledge pretty fast. But we have this one. So, Zara hit with a $5 million lawsuit over bait-and-switch pricing. Now, if you've never heard of Zara, Zara is a Spanish, as in the country, Spain. They are a Spanish outlet. And fortunately, they gave us a brief at the beginning, so we have to go through the entire article. So, a U.S. consumer has filed a lawsuit against the Spanish fast fashion retailer Zara's American unit over deceptive pricing practices, according to the law business uh, publication The Fashion Law. The proposed class action seeks $5 million or more in damages. Why is that? Zara, owned by Inditex, the largest apparel company in the world and the innovator of fast fashion, lists its prices in euros enticing U.S. customers with lower numbers because the euro is stronger than the dollar, so the prices will look as though they're lower. But according to the suit filed by shopper Devin Rose in the United States District Court for the Central District of California, 
the US dollar amount charged is far above the going currency exchange rate. To make this very simple, if let's say, um, if let's say that the exchange rate between the euro and the dollar was, um, 66%, okay? So one US dollar would be 66% of a euro. I don't know, what what is lower than a euro? I thought a euro was like a dollar. What What is the change for a euro? Half a euro? I don't know, I never looked. Now I'm curious. I'm not gonna look it up right now though, I'll just stay curious. So anyway, if they were going to, if you had a piece of, of clothing that was worth say one euro, that should, should come out to about a dollar fifty. Be very simple. What they were finding out though is that your one euro piece of clothing, they were actually charging somewhere in the neighborhood of like five dollars for. And of course, people in the US, not knowing exchange rates in general, would have no idea and they would just pay the price saying, well, I mean, sounds like a good deal, it's very fashionable. Must be worth it, right? They were being swindled. Quite purely and plainly, they were being swindled. And so this uh, this class action lawsuit has been filed, and this was filed actually a long time ago. This is back in 2016. I don't actually know whatever happened with this. And this is a very short article. It doesn't say anything about it. Oh, but here we go. It says the actual euro dollar exchange rate would have resulted in a 995 euro shirt costing approximately 1126 each, according to the fashion laws account it was filing. Instead, however, Zara charged Mr. Rose 1790 per garment, a markup of nearly 60%. Now, that on its own is not actually illegal. It's the lying about it that was illegal. If they had simply, you know, stated that they were not going, or that there would be a markup, that's fine. As long as you're honest about what you're doing. And so this is bait and switch. And again, bait and switch is usually pretty hard to hide because once it comes out, well, especially nowadays, you get a publication and then everybody knows about what you're doing. So it's not a very good long-term plan. So now that we've talked about, you know, what is fraud and what is bait and switch, and you should have a pretty good idea of what both those are, let's get into the entire reason why we're here today. Now, this of course was a video done by Night's Watch, and if you're not familiar with the Night's Watch, go watch them. They are a phenomenal channel. They deserve everything they've got and more. But they did an episode on the um, the Scott Pilgrim versus the World Netflix adaptation. And as it turns out, much as they were afraid of, it was exactly that. It was a bait and switch. Now, not going to go into the entire plot of Scott Pilgrim versus the World, but to make it very, very clear and very simple, the main character of Scott Pilgrim vs. the World is Scott Pilgrim. Now there's of course an entire cast of characters around them. I couldn't name all of them. However, the co-protagonist, basically the love interest and the person that he goes through the whole story both for and with, is Ramona. And the entire story, at least as far as I know, is essentially him trying his best to get the attention of Ramona because he wants to date her and he wants them to be together. It's a very simple story, and then the fun of the story is the antics along the way. And so it was a graphic novel or a comic book originally. Not that much of a difference between them, but either way. It was that originally, it was adapted into, not the most faithful as I understand it, but still a fun and mostly faithful movie. And then we got this. 
And what happened in this is, in the very first episode, the character of Scott Pilgrim was written out of the show. In this case, I do believe he was killed off in the show, but regardless of what happened, his character has been removed from the show. He is the title character of the show. And when people tuned in, they expected to see the main character of the show, the character who has been in the title of the show, the main character of both the movie and the graphic novel, they expected to see that. And why wouldn't they? After all, it was named after the movie and after the graphic novel. It was named after a story that has already been done. It was sold as an adaptation for a story that has already been done. And so for them to remove the main character in the very first episode, we would call that a bait and switch. You have been sold a product. And then when you showed up to the product, that was not it. However, this is not new, and it's also not a crime. Not yet, because we have actually been doing this for a long time. Now, I cannot go deep into this idea of, you know, what, what changed in Scott Pilgrim and what things are different, because I'm not that familiar. I've only seen the movie. I could not go into a deep discussion on it. What I could go into a deep discussion on, however are things like Halo, which, I mean, you can't really see this because they put their stupid banner down here. Paramount Mount or Massacre's Master Chief and Halo pulls a bait-and-switch bigger than Kevin Smith's He-Man. Now, I didn't play a lot of the Halo games, but I fell in love with the Halo universe, and I went hard into the lore of it. I liked the characters. I liked the setting. I like everything about it. And when they advertised the Halo uh, show, the, the live-action adaptation of it, who did they put first and foremost in front of every single poster, every single thumbnail, everything? Well, of course, it would be the main character of the Halo franchise. It would be Master Chief, otherwise known as John117, I believe? I think that's it. His name is John, at least. I know that much. Now, when they did this, of course, they had to use Master Chief because he is the main character and he is the one that everybody wanted to, to see. Once we got into the show, however, we found out that, number one, Master Chief was there, technically. But as they pointed out, as if the Master Chief's numerous helmet removals or the series completely out of character sex scenes weren't proof positive enough, the season finale of the Paramount Plus live-action Halo TV adaptation has presented audiences with a bait-and-switch twist that solidifies the fact that the once-beloved and unique sci-fi series has been reduced to yet more generic Hollywood trash. Because at the end of the day, the Halo series, which used Master Chief as the mascot and you know, face, was in fact not about him. You couldn't, they, they made it about the other Spartans. In particular, the female Spartans who fought alongside of him, or sometimes fought in place of him, or sometimes were rescuing him. A lot of people were not happy about that one. However, there was a bit of an excuse for this one because it did just say, Halo. And so, when you took the Halo universe and you said, you know what? We all wanted to see Master Chief, but it wasn't called the Master Chief Show. So, I mean, I, I guess that was kind of on us. That was our fault. We, 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 went, we went into it with expectations and you failed our expectations. Do you know what we can't make that excuse for? Obi-Wan Kenobi. 
Now, in the same vein of bait and switch shows, we have this one, which is a show that a lot of people were asking for for a very long time, and then when we finally got it, a lot of people were very disappointed by it. The reason being, it was advertised that the Obi-Wan Kenobi series was going to be showing us what happened with the character of Obi-Wan Kenobi between the events of Episode 3 and 4. There's a very large time gap there where nothing has been filled in. And after the series, people were actually starting to wish it had never been filled in. Because what they advertised was a show about Obi-Wan and how he was getting by during the time of the Galactic Empire while still trying to look over and keep safe Luke Skywalker. Because that was why he was on Tatooine in the first place, was to make sure that the son of Anakin stayed safe. The daughter of Anakin had already been sent away with family, another family that he trusted. Obi-Wan was just trying to do his part. But as it turns out, the Obi-Wan Kenobi show was not about Obi-Wan Kenobi. This became very, very obvious in the first episode when we did get a few clips of him, but we spent more time with the daughter Leia than we did with Obi-Wan Kenobi. And so immediately, people wheeled on the show, accusing it of being a bait-and-switch, and saying that you've made this entire show about this precocious little Mary Sue girl who is seemingly smarter than all the adults, more capable than all the adults, uh, more right than all the adults, and seemingly faster and sometimes even stronger than all of the adults around her. That's really weird. And so many people thought this was going to be a bait-and-switch, making Leia the main character of the Obi-Wan Kenobi show. And how wrong they were. Because it was then revealed that in fact it was not Leia who was the main character of the Obi-Wan Kenobi show, but we were introduced to the Inquisitor Reba. Reva? Whatever, the Inquisitor. And the show then shifted to be about her. It was all about her hunt for Obi-Wan Kenobi and what she had to do to get to him and find him. It was all about her past, where she was nearly killed, <clears throat> and this is where, or one of the places where people getting stabbed by lightsabers became a completely passe thing because she's apparently been stabbed by lightsabers many times and has survived every single time. That notwithstanding, though, it became about her beginning at the Jedi Temple. It became about her joining the Empire as an Inquisitor, her working with the other Inquisitors and even betraying them, her going off on her own trying to find Obi-Wan Kenobi, her rebelling against Darth Vader, and eventually her going after and trying to kill Luke Skywalker and the rest of his family. She became the main character of the show, and Obi-Wan Kenobi just kind of took a back seat in his own show, at least until the very last episode, when he had to have his showdown, which brought him front and center again. If only for a brief time. And as you can see, we have the reviews for all six episodes of the season, and not a single one of them rises above 50%. People came expecting a show about Obi-Wan Kenobi. And remember what I said about how most bait-and-switch schemes don't generally get very far because once it's made public that they are a bait-and-switch, well, people stop going. And this is beautiful evidence to that point. Another case, which I can speak to, and I couldn't find any good opinion articles, so I had to go to Reddit for this one. This I found when I was looking at the Wheel of Time, which if you're familiar with my channel at all, especially with the gaming content I make, I am a big, big fan of the Wheel of Time. And in fact, I even started an entire RimWorld series based on the Wheel of Time 
after seeing what they had done to season one of it, because The Wheel of Time is a 14-book series, still holding the record of the longest fantasy series in the world. It's very good. And if you're, if you're brave enough, it's very much worth your time. And in the series, it primarily follows four characters. Those characters are Rand, Matt, Perrin, and Egwene. And they are absolutely the main characters, which is really hard in a series which has hundreds of named characters. Robert Jordan named more characters in his books than George Lucas did in his movies. That's a feat. But they were the main characters, and in fact, there was a word for them. Now, Egwene, notwithstanding, although it is arguable, that word is Tavirin. It is a word in the language in the books, and if you had to translate it directly, it essentially means those who pull the weave around them, but we can simply translate that into English as main characters. After all, why is it that the main characters always seem to win? Why is it that everything always seems to work out for the main characters? Because the plot demands it. Well, in The Wheel of Time, they actually have an explanation for that. So they are the main characters. They, they are the main characters, not just by the fact that they've been written to that position, but because they have a special property about them that makes them the main characters. And so, in the books, most of the time, there are, of course, little side jaunts here and there, but most of the time, the story is following one of those four characters because they are the ones who drive the entire plot. But then we got the, the live-action adaptation of The Wheel of Time, which is something that a lot of people were very excited for, a lot of people had a lot of trepidation for, because how do you possibly adapt an entire 14-book series, each one of them a doorstopper on its own, into an eight-episode season? You can't. And so a lot of people knew that this was going to be bad from the beginning but nobody understood quite how bad because among many, many other things, including outright ignoring the own or the story's own rules, changing locations, changing characters, changing races, changing sexes, changing just about everything they could, they changed the main character. Instead of it being one of the four who supposedly pull the plot along with them, they made the main character the woman who found them instead. And instead of following their exploits as they drive the world towards its inevitable end, they instead followed her and how she was supposed to drive them to drive the plot to the point where she actually had to invent new powers and break the written rules of the universe to make it happen. And after two seasons of this, the audience response to the Wheel of Time, at least Amazon's Wheel of Time, has been dismal at best, which has led a lot of people to ask, how is this show even getting funded? We'll get to that in a minute, though. Because before we talk about how that's happening, I want to go back and touch on Disney. Now, as I already established, we talked about Disney a while ago. And we talked about Disney in terms of the race baiting they were doing in all their shows. Which I just did a very, very simple Google search. I, I typed in Disney race swaps, and look at what I got. We've got, of course... Um, The Little Mermaid. So, there's that. Tinkerbell was changed. Uh, what else we got? Um, 
there was another one down here, wasn't it? Uh, Mulan is still Chinese, so that one... Didn't they have a Lilo and Stitch one? I thought they had a Lilo... Yeah, it was right here, actually. Yeah, so they took the Hawaiian character in Lilo and Stitch, made them white. Um, I don't know why there's a picture of Velma in here, but I mean, why not? That's not Disney, but it's another case. Race swaps, over and over again. Why? Well, that's kind of what people have been asking. Why? Especially with the latest one coming out, that being Snow White. Where they're supposed to have what would, I assume, be a German woman who is incredibly pale, given her description and even her name, and they turned her Hispanic. I think it's Hispanic. I'm not sure. I think it is. I'm not. I'd, I'd have to go look it up. And you know what? I don't care enough to look it up. The point being, they have made a habit out of this. In fact, they've made an entire business model out of this. To the point where it has actually become parody. Although that's South Park and they parody everything, so not exactly a high bar. Point is, this is nothing new. And why did they do it? Well, because while this is different than the bait and switch we were talking about before, it is, in essence, the same thing. They've taken a well-established property, like, say, The Little Mermaid. Something that most of us grew up with. The, the Little Mermaid being almost 40 years old now, I think. Something that has a built-in audience. Something that we all know, and we had expectations when we went to see it. Only for us to find out that they had changed it. It was no longer what we wanted. It was no longer something that anybody would have gone to. And we can prove that because, as I stated before, when we were talking about bait and switch, bait and switch schemes don't work. Not in the long term. They will work in the short term before word gets out and before people catch on to the game being played. Once the game is out, the bait and switch falls apart, which is what we've seen. In many of these movies, they have had a decently strong opening. Most of them have recovered most of their money, usually in their opening weekend. But what do we see after the opening weekend? They completely fall off the radar. And they stop making money. They stop making influence. They stop basically existing. Except in the realm of opinion articles and online forums. Why? Because people were sold a bill of goods. They were sold a movie that they supposedly wanted to see. Only for the product being offered to not be that. But as I pointed out, this is not illegal. And there are questions as to whether or not it should be. Is this, or could this, or rather, could this be illegal? That's really hard, because right now we stand in the realm of freedom. This is freedom of speech. This is freedom of expression. This is freedom of assembly. Uh, what else would this be? I'm not sure. But either way, we have those. See, here's the hard part. Number one. There is absolutely nothing wrong with them going through and doing this from a technical perspective. After all, a really great example of this is going to be The Wiz. Does anybody know The Wiz? Did anybody see The Wiz? Either the, the, um, the stage play or the movie? Did anyone see The Wiz? If you're not familiar with The Wiz, it is an adaptation of The Wizard of Oz. And everyone should know what The Wizard of Oz is. Dorothy, Toto, the tornado, landing in Oz, 
the Good Witch of the North, the Wicked Witch of the West, Scarecrow, Tin Man, Lion, Wizard. Everybody should know that story, even if they've never seen it, because it's just that prevalent in culture. The Wiz, however, was an adaptation of that. They took the story, and then they made their own take on it. This time it took place in, I believe, Harlem? Or something like that. And they changed the entire cast to be black. This was a black take on The Wizard of Oz. And it was... I don't know if it was tremendously successful, but it was very successful. And it's very good if you've never seen it. It's good. It's different. But it never pretended to be The Wizard of Oz. There is no point where they actually expected people to throw away their copy of The Wizard of Oz and replace it with this. And that's the real difference. See, people were not misled into going to see The Wiz. It was advertised as being what it is. And so people went in with the appropriate expectations and they enjoyed it. And the people who did not want to go see The Wiz did not go see it. And they were confident enough that their product would stand on its own, and as a matter of fact, it did. And it continues to this day with live performances. They have a good product. What we look at nowadays, especially when it comes to things like Disney, is they have a bad product. And at a certain level, they know it's a bad product product because they're using the bait and switch tactic to sell it remember what i said before when we were talking about bait and switch and we looked at this and it said they switch customers from buying an advertised product or service that the seller initially offered into buying a different product or service usually at a higher price or has some other advantageous effect for the advertiser normally it's a higher price or an increased profit to the seller or it may have less marketable characteristics than the product advertised. What we are seeing right now is that exact thing. Now, we've got to be a little bit careful here. Otherwise, somebody is going to get really, really hurt over this. That is not to say that by, by race swapping people, we are making something of a less quality product. That's not true. As I just established, The Wiz is a completely race-swapped version of The Wizard of Oz, and it is tremendously successful. What we have here is a case of people who believe that race is actually more important than creativity. It doesn't really matter what product you put out as far as they're concerned, so long as you can check off all the boxes. The idea being that if you can just appeal to a wide enough audience, if you get a, a lower margin of that audience, you can still come up with a profit so long as you hit enough audiences. And while mathematically, on paper, that seems like it might be a working strategy, it has not worked yet. And it continues to fail. Which again brings us back to the idea of, is this illegal or can this be made illegal and have it criminalized? To answer that question is a little bit hard and it's not going to be a direct one. But the answer to that is a firm maybe. As we've already established, Is this deceptive? Yes. Now, because they're using deception to get you to come and see the movie, does that make it fraud? Yes. Now, is it because they're offering you one piece of, of um, content and then providing you a different piece of content? Kinda. 
See, the thing is, they're actually kind of relying on a particular subset of the audience, that being the ignorant, negligent, and naive audience. See, we can't actually accuse them of a bait-and-switch because in the case of, say, The Little Mermaid, they did not put this Ariel up and then have her play the role. She was actually front and center on all the posters. And so nobody can actually accuse Disney of lying. They didn't. Not technically, anyway. However, that being said, they were relying on the built-in audience for The Little Mermaid, who, when they were told there would be a live-action adaptation of it, were expecting a live-action one-for-one shot of the original animated Little Mermaid. And they did not get that. That is partially on the audience and partially on Disney. But what is entirely on Disney and not on the audience? Something called fiduciary duty. I don't know if I ever talked about this before, but I will go ahead and give a quick explanation of fiduciary duty. This is going to be the last point that we're going to hit today. We're going to have a short lecture this time. The idea of fiduciary duty is very, very simple, and it's something that comes into play when a company goes public and takes on public investment into it. Basically, if you own stock in a company, that company owes you a fiduciary duty. So let's define that. Fiduciary duty is essentially their implicit contract with you that you have invested in them, and so they are going to invest in you. Not directly, obviously, but it means that they are going to make every single effort they can to grow the company, to turn a profit, and to grow your investment with them. When people talk about the fact that corporations only ever care about money, the only thing that matters to a corporation is the bottom line and staying in the black or turning, in most cases, a continuous growth profit. So, for example, they say that every single quarter they want to see a growth of 5%. That means that if they started at, say, I don't know, a stock price of $10 today, by next quarter, that stock price should be $12. And by next quarter, that stock price should be uh, 20% of 12 is going to be 14.4 if I, if I did my math right. So yeah, next quarter, 14.4. And the quarter after that, I'm not going to do the math but it should be 5% more than that. That's why all of the, these corporations continuously try to just increase the stock price because they have what's called a fiduciary duty to their investors. Now, does that mean that most of these corporations are actually the victims here and we should feel sorry for them? No, not in the least little bit. In fact, hold their feet to the fire. No, don't hold their feet to the fire. Put their feet in the fire, okay? Because I guarantee they deserve it. But that being said, we are going to add a little bit of a caveat here and say they have to do this. Now, they volunteered for the position, and so everything that happens while they're in that position is on them. But they do have to do this. Because if you don't you are now in breach of your fiduciary duty, and that is a crime. Now, this law is in place ostensibly so that you can't actually just crash a company. You cannot open up your company and say, we're going to go public, 
okay? And we're gonna take in stock investors. And then you rake in maybe a few hundred thousand, maybe a few million dollars in investor capital. You cannot then sell the entire company, sell off all of your assets, take the money and run. That's fraud because you lied to people to get them to invest. And it is a breach of fiduciary duty because these people expected a return on their investment. Now, there's also contracts and such that go into this where they will they have to show their numbers and their proposals for how much they expect the company to grow as it's going. It gets a lot more complicated. This is something that would fall under contract law. Again, I'm not a lawyer. All I can do is give you the basics. But fiduciary duty keeps them from doing things like that. Now, why is this important? Because right now, Disney is staring down the barrel of multiple breaches of fiduciary duty lawsuits. Let's go ahead and read just a little bit of this. We're, we're not going to read the whole thing. I don't want to... Well, eh. No, we could actually read the whole thing. Let's read the whole thing. Let me make it bigger. Okay. Uh, let's see. Schubert... Uh, John Kier and Kolb LLP is investigating a potential derivative claims on behalf of shareholders of the Walt Disney Company relating to possible false and misleading statements and breaches of fiduciary duty related to subscriber growth on the company's streaming platform, Disney+. Plus. On November 6, 2023... Oh, by the way, did I mention that this, this article came out like four days ago? Because this article came out four days ago. This is happening now. Plaintiffs filed a consolidated securities class action complaint in the U.S. District Court for the Central District of California alleging a nine-part scheme by Disney and certain of its current and former officers and directors to mislead the company's shareholders concerning projected rates of subscriber growth on Disney+. Among other things, plaintiffs allege that between December 10, 2020 and May 10, 2023, the defendants set unattainably high Disney Plus subscriber targets to boost the company's stock price and then took several actions to maintain their alleged scheme, including reorganizing the company, masking, quote, unsustainable content costs with, quote, accounting manipulations, and then reass repeatedly reassuring shareholders the projections were on track, which they were not. The, when the truth began to emerge in November of 2021, the company's stock price plummeted in several stages, erasing billions, with a B, in shareholder value. Then, on August 9th, 2023, Disney disclosed a $2.65 billion impairment charge, the vast majority of which was, quote, related to the removal of content and the termination of certain third-party license agreements. By the way, in case you hadn't heard, um, Disney Plus is actually shutting down. At least this is what I was told. You can fact check me on this one. Disney Plus is shutting down and the Disney Plus content is being rolled into Hulu. Because Disney Plus is just simply unsustainable. During the relevant period, the securities class action plaintiffs also alleged that certain Disney executives, including CEO Robert A. Iger and former CFO Christine M. McCarthy, unloaded a combined $393 million of their personal Disney stock. Which, by the way, what they what they're calling or what they're describing here, this would be insider trading. Insider trading is any stock trading done with knowledge not available to the public. Meaning that they're accusing Iger and McCarthy of seeing where the ship was going, of knowing that Disney was about to go down in flames and selling off their stock while it was still valuable while leaving every single other stockholder holding the bag. The Schubert firm is investigating potential breaches of fiduciary duty by Disney's officers and directors in connection with these allegations. Now, how does this relate to what we were talking about? Well, let's go back to Obi-Wan Kenobi here for a minute. 
because this is Disney. Okay? Obi-Wan Kenobi, you can actually go and watch on Disney Plus right now. It is a Disney property because Disney owns Lucasfilm. And look at those reviews. They're bad. And guess what? The viewership for the Obi-Wan Kenobi series is equally bad. I don't have a chart pulled up. Maybe I should have had a chart pulled up with all the, the viewing numbers of what they were watching. But it's bad. Many of their series have been bad. Obi-Wan Kenobi was bad. The Book of Boba Fett was bad. The Mandalorian started off good. However, its numbers have also been going down too. The Star Wars movies are tanking with, I believe it was the Solo movie being the first Star Wars movie in history to lose money. And then the rise, was it the Rise of Skywalker did even worse. And that's not even touching the Disney core content. The Little Mermaid did poorly. It, it did bad. Um, Peter Pan and Wendy did bad. Many of these shows have been abject failures. As a matter of fact, and this is not necessarily related to the bait and switch thing, but we're still getting the numbers in from the Marvels. The Marvels is looking like it's on track to be the biggest flop in Disney history. And every single time one of these movies or TV shows loses money, Disney loses money. And when Disney loses money, the stock price loses money. And when the stock price loses money, the stockholders ask why. Because if they're doing everything they can to ensure that Disney is profitable and growing, and they still lose money, then there's no problem here. They are simply a failing business. Businesses fail. However, if it can be shown that the reason why Disney is losing money is the direct action of the people in charge, now we have a breach of fiduciary duty. So, why is Disney losing money? Well, they're losing money because of their marketing and their advertising. People don't want to hear it. They're getting tired of having the message preached at them. They're being tired of being, being beaten over the head by it. They're tired of seeing it in their movies. They're tired of seeing it in their shows. They're tired of being promised one show only to have it be replaced either in character, in setting, or in a, its entirety with something else that is at least, at the very least, not what they expected or wanted to see, but at the most, something completely antithetical to what they were going to see. And every single time these decisions are made, we are looking at a potential breach of fiduciary duty. And so now that takes us back to the original decisions being made in terms of their film and television, and whether or not what they're doing is actually legally actionable. Is this illegal? No. But is it illegal for it to be advertised the way it's being advertised currently? Maybe. This is something that's going to have to go to court and it's going to have to be argued. And this lawsuit for the breach of fiduciary duty may be the beginning of this because if the lawsuit is taken up, it will have to go to discovery. Evidence will have to be brought in and it will have to be argued. And if it's found out that essentially people are not paying the money because whenever they go to see a show, they are getting something 
not what they were what they were expecting it may show that disney has been in the practice of bait and switch and if disney can be shown to be in the practice of bait and switch so can paramount so can amazon so can netflix All we need right now is precedent. We don't have that yet. This is still completely new ground. But we stand at the precipice of it. Where this goes from here, and what happens to Hollywood and media as a whole, is going to hinge on these lawsuits which are going to be coming in the next probably about five, maybe ten years. And it's going to change the entire landscape of the media environment. If this is found to be bait and switch content, it may result in things like Disney, if they want to do their live actions, they may have to take a similar premise, but make an entirely new kind of movie. Which would not be a bad thing. There is always an audience out there for what you want to make, okay? Even my content, which is not great, has an audience. It's not a very big audience, but then again, I'm also not Disney. It may push them in the direction of making more original content or more inspired content. At the same time though, if these lawsuits fall through, and it turns out that it is not a bait-and-switch operation, it means that we will get more of this. Which, unfortunately, is going to result in probably a collapse. If I had to make a comparison, I would, I would have to compare it to the great video game collapse back in the 1980s and early 90s. Which, if you weren't there, actually, I don't think it was really in the 90s, 70s and 80s, probably. The, the video game industry collapsed. What happened was, you had consoles like the Atari, you had the Odyssey, you had the ColecoVision, you had all these different consoles. And there were no standards whatsoever. None. If you could put it on a cartridge and sell it, you, you did. There were no quality standards, there was no quality assurance, and there was no repercussions either, because it was essentially buyer beware. The end result is that the market was flooded with so much non-working garbage that so, so many people turned away from video gaming as a whole that the industries collapsed. Every single video game industry was reduced to life support and those who couldn't afford the life support simply went out of business which left Atari Sega a few others and honestly the the um the recovery didn't really start until Nintendo came into the scene with the um uh what was it it was the Famicom which would then later become the Nintendo Entertainment System. And the fact that they were actually willing to go through and institute quality standards. So that if you got Nintendo games, you knew what you were getting and you knew that it would work. It doesn't necessarily mean it was good, but at least it would work. It would function. Sega did the same thing with their Master System, which would then become the Sega Genesis. And even Atari made a comeback after enough people were willing to reinvest into the video game industry. And we know where that went from there. Hollywood may be heading in the same direction because if we can't get a hold on this, if nobody can trust anything that they're seeing, whether it's in a trailer or a poster or a review or whatever it is, because you know, you just know that when you go, when you actually go to get the content, whether that's on TV or in the theater or on your phone, if you know 
that it's not going to be what you wanted, if you know it's not going to be what you expected, if you know it's going to be pretty much the antithesis of everything you wanted out of it, then you're not going to bother. And if enough people don't bother, then they don't make any money. And if all these studios don't make any money, they're going to be forced into basically one of two paths. They're going to have to course correct, in which case they do like what Nintendo did, institute new standards, and the entire industry writes itself, or they can stay the course right off the cliff. In the case of, say, Disney, they seem absolutely intent on riding that train right off the cliff. And you know what? If that's what they want to do, then let them do it. But that's where we stand now. We're, we're at the, the fulcrum point. We're waiting to see which way this is going to tip. But we could see the point where this actually becomes actionable. We could see it where this idea of bait and, bait and switch in television is eventually criminal. And I think that we would all be better for it. Force them to admit what they're doing, to put it front and center, to be proud of it, and then let the people decide. But until that happens, it's only going to continue getting worse. And so all I can say is I wish you luck out there in whatever it is that you want to watch, because right now it's a minefield. Grab a helmet. All right. So that's where I'm going to leave things off. Um, I said everything I wanted to. That should give everyone a pretty good overview of what's going on right now, at least as far as I see it. And since I'm the one talking, you know, my opinion is kind of the one that matters at the moment. Um, what's going on next week? Ah, uh, I have no idea if I have anything going on next weekend. I might? What is next weekend? Where's my calendar? Next weekend is the 2nd of December. It's the 2nd of December. Oh, okay. Um, I might be busy. So I cannot promise a lecture next week. Uh, if there is, you'll see the, or you'll see the, um, the live stream go up and you'll get notifications for that. Tomorrow there is no tabletop stream. I know, we all want to go back and do more Warhammer, Warhammer 40k stuff. There is no tabletop stream. I'll even put out a, a community post later to remind people there's no tabletop stream tomorrow. I will be in New Jersey. So, send me helmets. I'll probably need them. But we will be back the next week and we'll get back into that. So look forward to that. Otherwise, though, if you're enjoying this and you want more of it, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon. That way you get notified every time these, these videos come out. You can get rid of this, I think. There we go. If you know somebody else who's also complaining a whole lot about the media and the fact that everything that they ever loved and cherished is being replaced or torn apart or whatever it is, you can go ahead and share this uh, this lecture with them. They might enjoy it. I can't promise anything, but, you know, what is YouTube if not a series of echo chambers? That being said, though, if you just like me, leave a like on this stream. Leave comments down below. If you want to yell at me in person, and metaphorically speaking, you can join the Discord, and you can yell at me in real time. I'm, I'm there most of the time, so it's all good. Otherwise, though, I look forward to seeing you in the next stream, whatever that happens to be. I don't know yet. So, I look forward to seeing you then, and until then, take care.